The message that you're about to hear is entitled, Jesus is Enough, by Dr. Curtis Hudson, and was recorded at the Florida Bible College in Hollywood, Florida, during a Saturday evening service, January 1979. Well, we're usually out of here tonight by this, every night by this time. I think the latest night was on Wednesday when we was out by about uh, seven minutes before nine, and it's already 12 minutes afterwards. Now, I have two problems. Number one, you've just finished eating, and you feel more like going to sleep than you do listen to a sermon. And number two is, I've just finished eating. <laughs> I feel like the man who dreamed that he ate a 50-pound marshmallow and got up and found his foam rubber pillow missing. A preacher went to candidate for a church or a tryout for a church. And he preached that Sunday morning and that Sunday afternoon they was getting ready to eat and he said, no, thank you, I won't eat anything. He said, I never eat before I preach. He said, I can't preach if I eat first. And they said, oh, you may as well eat. He said, no, I wouldn't eat for anything. He said, I can't preach if I eat first. And the mother stayed at home, washed dishes after supper, and the little girl went to church with the preacher. The little girl got home, her mother said, well, how did the preacher do? She said, he may as well eat. <laughs> so I eat. I'm not sure that's good. The meal was delicious, and I commend the cooks in the back. And I commend you for your faithfulness this week to these revival services night after night. Saturday night. You know, I've been told across the country, you can't have a meeting on Saturday night. Well, I wish all those folks were here to see this. We have a meeting on Saturday night. The pastor's wife said, tell some stories about Uncle Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Uncle Bud uh, got sick and went to see his doctor, and the doctor examined Uncle Bud and said, Uncle Bud, we found sugar in your blood. Uncle Buddy began to shout. He said, glory to God. Hallelujah. He was tongue-tied. He shouted all over the office. Doc said, Bud, I said you got sugar in your blood. He shouted, Glory to God. Hallelujah. He said, I, I know this good old-time religion was getting dooder and dooder, but I didn't know it was turning to tugger. <laughs> it was supposed to be getting dooder and dooder and tweeter and tweeter. But well, you're a good crowd tonight. I, I want to be appropriate in my sermon and share something to be a blessing to you. If you have a Bible open to Acts chapter 8, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the story, but tell the story and call your attention to two expressions and speak briefly and give you a three-point sermon tonight. Very simple sermon. I hope you'll listen. In Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 26 and going to the end of the chapter, you have the, con the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, two or three things you ought to keep in mind. The eunuch, number one, was a very religious man. As a matter of fact, he had been to his church, and he evidently enjoyed the service. And on the way home from church, he had his Bible open to Isaiah chapter 53, the chapter our brother sung about earlier. And he was reading Isaiah 53 on his way home from the church. Now, that's very religious. I don't know many people who go to church, and after having left the church service, they say, I haven't had enough, let's read the Bible on the way home. Most people who go to church close their Bible and put it up till next Sunday, but not this man. He is very religious. Not only was he a very religious man, but he was a very honest and trusted man. He was a treasurer for the queen in charge of everything she had. She trusted him with everything she had. So he was a very honest man, very trusted man, very religious man. He was a man who read his Bible very much and enjoyed reading it. And he was a very kind man in that he invited this stranger, Philip, up into the chariot with him in Acts chapter 8 when Philip drew near to the chariot. And you know something, with all that in mind, that man, if he had died, would not have gone to heaven. Though he loved the Bible and evidently loved God and loved the church. Though he was an honest and trusted man and probably one of the best citizens in the community. 
And any of us would have been delighted to have him as a member of our church and probably would have put him on the board. But if he had died, he would not have gone to heaven. He's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. There are 12 verses in Isaiah chapter 53. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said Isaiah chapter 53 is so precious that it ought to be written on parchment of gold and lettered with diamonds. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. What a chapter. Twelve verses and twelve mentions of the substitutionary death in that one short chapter, Isaiah 53. Here's the eunuch, he's riding in his chair, he's been to church, he's reading his Bible from Isaiah 53. He's reading. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord, Jehovah, the Father in heaven, hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And what he's reading, an evangelist named Philip, obeying what the Holy Spirit said to him, ran near to the chariot. The eunuch's got his Bible open, and he sees Philip running along beside the chariot, and he invites him up into the chariot. They ride along a moment or so further, and the evangelist Philip looks over at the man's Bible. It's open. And he opens the conversation in verse 30 by asking, Understandest thou what thou readest? The man gave a very honest reply. He said, How can I except some man should guide me? And then Philip began at the same scripture, Isaiah chapter 53. And the Bible said he preached unto him Jesus. This man wanted to know who this he and him and he and him had reference to in Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we're healed. The eunuch said, of whom speaketh the prophet these things? Of himself or some other man? Who's he talking about? And Philip preached from Isaiah 53, and he preached unto him Jesus. They had not been riding very long, and then the eunuch said to him, See, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they commanded the chariot to stand still. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Now look here. You know what I'd like to do tonight, if time permitted? I'd like to just walk around through the congregation and ask you one by one, every individual here, if you die tonight, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? I'd like to wait for your reply. And when I came to someone who said, no, I do not know if I die, I'm going to heaven. I'd like to stay there a moment and ask a second question. I'd like to ask you this question, why are you not a Christian? And I tell you now, though I cannot go through the congregation and talk to you individually, everybody here who has not yet trusted Jesus Christ as Savior has an excuse for having not done so. And I promise you tonight, no matter, absolutely no matter what your excuse is, I can take it away from you. If you say to me, well, I'm not a Christian because there's too many hypocrites in the church, I'd simply smile and say, had you rather spend an eternity in hell with hypocrites or had you rather spend a few years with them in church? And the logical man say, I'd rather spend a few years in church. And all, there's a lot of people be at the Super Bowl tomorrow. They say they don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites there. And there'll be more hypocrites at the Super Bowl tomorrow than will in all the churches in Miami put together. That's just a reason for not accepting Christ as Savior. I don't know what your excuse is, but I'm going to tell you something. The most common excuse given to me by those who have not yet trusted Christ is, well, I don't understand it. The Bible just doesn't make sense to me. I, I, just, I just can't understand it. 
All right, if that's your excuse, I'm going to tell you tonight very simply. By the way, that was a eunuch's excuse. I don't understand these things. How can I? Then there are three simple things a man must understand to be saved. Number one, he must understand that he is a sinner. Sometimes when we say to a congregation, you are sinners, the man gets the idea that we feel we're awful righteous and pious and we're sort of looking down on him and talking down on him. Well, I want you to know I don't mean to be talking down on you. Because the Bible said not only are some sinners, the Bible said all men are sinners. And the eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. Look at verse 6. You need not open, but I'll quote it. He reads, all we like sheep have gone astray. How many? All of us. How far we strayed makes no difference. The fact that we went astray is what's important. When I was a little boy, if I'd ask you, if you'd asked me to bring a sinner, I'd have tried to find somebody that had committed every sin in the catalog and brought him to you. But the truth of the matter is, I could have found anybody anywhere, and I'd have had a sinner. Romans 3, 22 and 23 says there is no difference. And I say, wait a minute, God. What do you mean there's no difference? He said, that's what I mean, no difference. No difference in the crowd assembled here tonight and the crowd up here on Skid Row. God said, no difference. No difference in the little moral, clean kids and the prostitutes up here in town. He said, no difference. And I said, oh, I explain yourself, Lord. And he continues, there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God, when God looks at any of them and says, there's a bad man and there's a terrible man and there's a good lady and there's a better lady. When God looks at any, he says, no difference in the whole bunch from one side of the globe to the other. No difference in any of you. Because all sinned and came short of the glory of God. The word come short means to miss the mark. It's like I hung a target over here on the wall and I took time to give everybody in this building a dart and I said to you, now line up and do your best to hit the bullseye. Now take your time. And one by one you took your time and took dead aim and you threw the dart. And let's say that the pastor missed the bullseye by a quarter of an inch and uh, Dana missed the bullseye by a foot. And uh, Jim Sheffield missed the whole target. <laughs> and the chair of the board of deacons missed the whole wall. <laughs> and let's suppose all of us threw our dart at the bull's eye, and when we all had thrown darts, there were darts all over the wall, all over the target, all over the floor. I mean darts all over the building, but not a single dart in the bull's eye. I'd stand back and say there's no difference. You say, now, come on, man. The preacher only missed it a quarter of an inch, and old Sheffield missed the whole wall. What do you mean, no difference? I say, no difference, because all came short of the bullseye. And that's the way God looks at all of us. It's just about as near heaven from a molehill as it is from a mountain. It doesn't make any difference how good you live. You haven't lived perfect, and you haven't hit the bullseye. When I went to high school, you had to make 70 to pass. If you average anything less than 70, you failed and had to repeat the grade. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Let's say one guy averages 65 and the other guy averages 35. There's a 30 points difference and yet... There is no difference because both men must repeat the same grade because neither one made 70. There's a Negro spiritual they sometimes sing. 99 and a half won't do. <laughs> I like it. 99 and a half won't do. You say, but I never killed anybody. I never committed adultery. I never robbed a bank. Yes, but you haven't been perfect. A fellow went to jo Joyner Hankins, went to his doctor and said, Doc, what is the strongest poison known to man? And his doctor said, well, Brother Hankins, potassium cyanide. That's what they got at Jonestown. 
Well, he said, Brother Hankins, how much of that, Brother Hankins said, well, Doc, how much of that potassium cyanide would a man have to drink for it to kill him? The doctor said, Brother Hankins, potassium cyanide is so strong that if a man took the stopper out of a bottle of potassium cyanide and touched it underneath his tongue, where the blood vessels are nearest the surface, he wouldn't live to get the stopper back into the bottle. And Brother Hankins said, what difference would it make if he drank the whole bottle? Doc said it wouldn't make any difference, he'd just be dead. And in our sight, it makes a difference. We think that guy who's committed every sin in the catalog and lives like a dog, we think, boy, he's a bum! But God looks down and says, you're all bums. All of you came short of the glory of God. None of you are perfect. Sam Jones faced a congregation and said, does anybody here know a perfect person? And one lady raised her hand and he said, yes, ma'am, you know a perfect person? She said, I never met her, but my husband talks about her all the time. She was his first wife. Well, nobody's perfect. I've tried to live clean. Man, I would brag about what I haven't done. But I wouldn't no more go to heaven and tell God you ought to let me to heaven because I've tried to live good than anything in the world. I'd go to hell. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And nobody ever qualifies for sonship until they recognize their sinnership. You want to know my hardest job as an evangelist? It's getting people to admit that they're lost. They're like the Indian who wandered through the woods, lost. And the white man saw him and said, is the Indian lost? And he said, ugh, Indian not lost. He said, teepee's lost. He just wouldn't face the facts. <laughs> Over in Shoreham, England, they had a, a 40th anniversary of a savings and loan association. And they decided to celebrate their 40th anniversary. They'd have a beauty contest. And at the beauty contest, they'd give away washing machines and stoves and bank accounts and beautiful gifts, just numbers of them. And one of the board of directors decided, well, since it's our 40th anniversary, let's require that the lady who wins the beauty contest must be at least 40 years old. You know what happened. Nobody won it. <laughs> because every lady who was pretty enough to win it just wouldn't admit she was 40 years old. <laughs> and they kept bank accounts and washing machine and vacuum cleaners and new cars for one reason, because the ladies wouldn't admit they were 40 years old. We laugh at that, but the sad, sad fact is that God's going to keep a wonderful, wonderful heaven away from majority of people. I'm talking about the majority, because they just won't admit that they're sinners. Say, if I could go to heaven right now, if heaven was fixed like a building and had a big gate on the outside, and I could take me a stepladder and climb up high on the stepladder and get a paintbrush and paint and right across heaven's gate for sinners only, God would come out and look at it and smile. Say that boy knows what he's talking about and go back in. You know what the Bible says? Luke 15 and 10 says, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible said, Jesus said, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And sometimes if a man is a bad sinner, we say, or has done a, a many awful things, and he's just, I mean, he's just degraded, and society has cast him out, we feel like he's a hopeless case. But if you trace the steps of Jesus... You will find him going to the worst cases every time. When a doctor graduates from school and gets his medical degree, he doesn't want to wait on a patient who skin his elbow. He wants, a, he wants somebody that's cut up pretty bad. He wants an opportunity to demonstrate his skills. When a man graduates from law school, he doesn't want to write a will. He wants about a $5 million suit with about a 20% percent 
percent of it. He wants a hard case to show his skills. When I read the Bible, I get the idea God wants a hard case to show his skills. The woman in John 4, married five times, living in a common law marriage with a man who wasn't her husband, Jesus went straight to her. He seemed to go, he seemed to gravitate to the worst cases. John chapter 5, the pool of Bethesda, he went to the man that had been there 38 years. The guy that everybody had given up on. The worst case to his attention. I like that. And if I was a medic in the army, and I was on the battlefield and there were scores of people wounded, as I passed across the battlefield, I'd see one with a flesh wound, and I knew he was going to live, I'd move on to the next one. The one that I'd stop and try to help would be the one that was nearest death. But we think the one that God does not help is the one that's nearest death. That's wrong. Romans 5.20 said, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We first must understand that we're sinners or we can never be saved. And yet I say to a man, Well, are you a Christian? Well, he says, I, I know some deacons in the church don't live as good as I do. And he's right most of the time. I said, I'm not a Christian, but I live better than some folks who say they are. That's not the point. Do you live as good as Jesus? If you don't live as good as Jesus, then you need to be saved. And you'll never, never, never be saved till you recognize that you are a sinner. If you face that, then the second thing you have to understand is that Jesus Christ died for sinners. The eunuch is reading Isaiah chapter 53. There are 12 mentions of the substitutionary death in that chapter. My soul, the greatest truth that ever coursed through my brain is the truth of the substitutionary death of Jesus. We talk about his vicarious sufferings. He suffered in our place. God is a just God. He's also a loving God. And a just God said sin must be paid for. A just God said the wages of sin is death. And a just God cannot sacrifice his justice on the altar of his love. His justice must be satisfied or nobody could be saved. And the eunuch's reading, Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's a truth I never tire of hearing. Dana mentioned it earlier. He commented while he was singing between the songs. But it's a fact. Every sin you've ever committed and every one you ever will commit if you live to be a thousand years old, God laid those sins on Christ just like I laid that piece of paper over on my hands. And he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The sins I forgot about. The sins I could never recall. Every single one of my sins, Jesus bore them in his own body on the tree. And whether you believe it or not, and whether you ever do anything about it or not, you'll never change the fact that while Christ was bearing your sins in his own body, God poured his wrath out on Jesus. For God so loved the world, me and you, that he gave his only begotten son. And when Jesus died on that cross, he actually paid everything that I should have paid as a sinner. He actually suffered on the cross everything that men suffer in hell because he fully paid our debt. And then he screamed out from the cross, it is finished. And then they buried him. And after three days and nights in the grave, God raised him from the dead as a declaration to the world that I'm satisfied with the payment my son made for your sins. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he said, Okay, the debt has been paid. Let the prisoner go free. Let him out. John Mitchell, the once Attorney General of the United States of America, was released from prison this week. When they decided he had been in long enough to pay the debt, they let him out. 
And when Jesus Christ paid the debt on the cross with his life, then God raised him back from the dead and said, the debt is paid, and whether you believe it or not, and whether you ever do anything about it or not, you'll never change it. It's paid. It's paid. You don't spell salvation D-O. You spell it D-O-N-E. It's done. A little boy on a mission field was visited by a lady missionary. And he had religion. And he'd heard about church and God and the Bible. But he had never heard about the story of how Jesus died on the cross and suffered hell and paid the boy's debt. He had never got that grasped into his mind. And she told him about it. And he prayed and trusted Christ. A few weeks later, she was back in that same village and she noticed his face was changed. He was beaming. And she said, Billy, the countenance on your face is changed. You look different. What happened, son? And he said, Miss Missionary, I always knew that Jesus Christ was necessary. But I didn't know until the other week that he was enough. Jesus Christ is not only necessary, he's enough. A man died in a cheap hotel room in Texas after having squandered a fortune in search of something he never found. And before he died, he scribbled a poem on a sheet of paper with pencil. And they found it on a little rickety table. I wish I could remember every verse of the poem, but I think I can recall one. The first verse said, I've searched in vain a thousand ways, my fears to quell, my hopes to raise, and all I need, the Bible says, is Jesus. Jesus is the open sesame to heaven. J-E-S-U-S. Jesus exactly suits us sinners. I'm Baptist. I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred. And when I'll die, I'll be Baptist dead. I'm Baptist. <laughs> but it's not the label on the jar that's important. It's the ingredients inside that's important. I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me. You must understand you're a sinner. Secondly, you must understand that Jesus Christ died for sinners. He paid our debt. Thirdly, you must understand that you accept what Jesus Christ did by faith. After Philip had preached this, to the, eunuch, the eunuch saw a pool of water and said, Hey, here's some water. What's hindering me to be baptized? And contrary to what some believe, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. They didn't get a vote in a second or nothing. <laughs> Philip said, Now you'll have to wait till you get to church and we'll get a vote in a second and get a majority rule. No, he said, If you believe, okay. You see, I don't like that. Well, then you better take your scissors and cut Acts 8 out. I didn't write it, I just preach it. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is a son of God. And they said, Whoa. You find that boy in the original Greek. And they got out and went down the water and Philip baptized the eunuch. Now watch that. Man, he was saved one minute, baptized the next minute. Just like that. Bang, bang. Why? Because he believed. And the whole hang up now is on the word believe. Because everybody I ask says, well, I've always believed in God. They mean they've always believed there was a God. The best illustration of faith in the Bible is found in Hebrews 12, where it says, looking unto Jesus. Faith is not looking at Jesus, but faith is looking unto Jesus. Which is a way of saying, depending on Jesus, everybody looks at Jesus every time you date your checkbook. You're admitting that Jesus Christ existed. 
And I haven't run into too many little infidels, I mean infidels, recently. Most everybody admits there was a Christ. They look at, oh yes, he lived, he was a good man. No, he was more than a good man. He was God in human flesh. And he bore our sins in his body and suffered our hell and paid our debt. And that's enough to make a Presbyterian shout. <laughs> Believing is not looking at him and admitting they existed. Believing is looking unto him, which is another way of saying depending on him. Suppose I lived in a day when if you didn't pay your debts, you was imprisoned. And uh, Lee had co-signed a note for me to borrow $1,000, which I don't recommend for anybody to do. Just give me the $1,000. <laughs> and suppose I, I'm nervous and my, my, my debtor... Uh, a uh, creditor calls and says, listen, you, your, your, your $1,000 is due with interest tomorrow morning. And if it's not paid, we're going to lock you up. And I'm scared to death. And I call Lee and I say, Lee, uh, I, boy, I'm ashamed to tell you, but man, the money is due and I don't have the money. And they're going to lock me up in the morning. He'd say, Curtis, don't worry about it. Go and go to bed and go to sleep. Just look to me. Boy, that'd be a sweet sound. <laughs> Just look to me. What he's saying is, you depend on me, I'll pay it in the morning. Looking unto Jesus is depending on Jesus. Jesus says, you all are sinners and you all owe a debt. The wages of sin is death. And he said, that death is more than dying with a gunshot wound or cancer. He said, it's dying in a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Revelation 20, 14, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. He says, you're in debt and if you die, you'll go to hell and stay there forever. But he said, don't worry about it. Look to me. If I wasn't so dignified, oh, I'd shout thinking about it. Boy, I'm looking to Jesus. I don't know what you're looking to. I've been baptized, but I'm not going to go to heaven and say, here's my baptismal certificate. Can I, can I get in? Man, I'm looking to Jesus. Faith is not looking at Jesus, it's looking unto Jesus. Martin Luther translated Hebrews 12, off looking unto Jesus, which means turning your head away from everything else and looking only to Jesus. It means looking away from my works. Many religions say, well, now you work and do good and pay your just and honest steps and go to church and work and work and work. You can go to heaven, Maybe. But a guy who works for his salvation never knows whether he's saved or not because he never knows whether he's worked enough or not. And when he dies, he's going to hell and found out he couldn't have worked enough. You're going to try to earn heaven. <laughs> Man, when I started buying a house, I bought my first one for $5,500 and my house notes were $35 a month. And I've got my house notes up now to $574 a month. It ain't funny. <laughs> and I'm going to die trying to pay for a house. In 10 years, you can't buy a house down here, let alone a mansion in heaven. You could work 10 million lifetimes and never earn heaven. And if you're working to stay out of hell, the motive for your work would destroy the work to begin with. Because the motive is fear. I'm afraid I'm going to hell, so I work to go to heaven. And work must be motivated only by love. Our 1 Corinthians 13 said it profits nothing. So the motive behind the work would render the work ineffective if I could work. Off looking means looking away from everything else and looking only to Jesus. Looking away from my works. Looking away from my righteousnesses. Live right, but you don't live right to get saved. Get better, but you don't get better to get saved. You get saved to get better.
You can't get better till you do get saved. You don't have anything to get better with. That's like going to the hospital and say, I want to get in over here. I'm, I'm hurting. Well, he said, go home, get well, and we'll take you. If I can get well, I don't need him. You go to the bank to borrow money. When you can prove you don't need it, they'll loan it to you. But Jesus gives you salvation when you can prove you do need it. Off looking unto Jesus. It means depending on him. But looking away from everything else. Looking away from my works. Looking away from my righteousness. And even looking away from my church membership. I'm going to tell you something. Straight eyeball to eyeball. If you are saved you ought to join a church and go every time the doors open be a good church member. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're depending on the fact that you're joined the church to get you to heaven, you're going to hell through a church. Billy Sunday said getting into the church won't make a Christian out of you any more than getting into the garage and make an automobile out of you. <laughs> you can put a pole cat in the oven, it won't make a biscuit out of you. You just have a scorched pole cat. That's a... <laughs> looking away from my works, looking away from my righteousness, and though I'm a Baptist, I'm even looking away from my church membership. And I pastored a Baptist church 21 years. I got enough sense to know all them not saved. Got quiet then. Of course, you don't know, so you couldn't say amen. Truth of the matter is, Matthew 7, verse 22 indicates there'll be many in hell who went to hell through the church. They'll come to Jesus and say, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out devils in your name? Have we done many mighty wonderful works in your name? Then will I profess on them, depart from me, the work of iniquity I never knew you. You have to understand you are a sinner. You have to understand Christ died for sinners. And thirdly, you must understand you accept what Jesus did by faith. And faith is not looking at Jesus. It's looking unto Jesus. It's off looking unto Jesus. It's looking away from my works, away from my righteousness, away from my church membership. It's looking away from everything else and looking only to Jesus. If you get to heaven some other way, when you got up there, you'd make hell out of heaven. If you got to heaven by end, during to the end, you'd get to heaven and run around and say, Well, bless God. I had a hard time, thought several times I wouldn't make it, but I, hallelujah, I endured. <laughs> you'd make hell out of heaven, and we'd all want you to go back to hell where you belong. <laughs> Running around over the golden streets bragging on what you did. No, when you get to heaven, you're going to brag on Jesus. It's looking only to Jesus. I'm closing. You must understand you are a sinner. You must understand Christ died for sinners. And thirdly, you must understand that you accept what Jesus Christ did by faith. I have a difficult time not losing my patience with people. Because people just like you say, well, I, 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 I don't know whether I got enough faith or not. I, I'm not sure I have that much faith. It never did say he that has an awful lot of faith. It just says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. You can take a little bitty faith and get a great big Savior. If you had enough faith to eat breakfast this morning, you got enough faith to be saved. And everybody here ate breakfast by faith unless you cooked it yourself. <laughs> you men came into the kitchen and said, Where are my eggs? She said, there in a plate, you half asleep, you dove in. You didn't even ask her, did you put rat poison in it? <laughs> you didn't put it through a chemical analysis to find out it was pure. You just ate it by faith, trusting her. And some men have lost their lives that way. <laughs> did you know in Jonestown they had... Uh, what they call them, white knights. They had a name for them when they would have what I'd call a dry run. He had often, Jones had often assembled his congregation together and give them a little tablet and tell them it was poison, they would kill them. And, and many of them took those on several occasions thinking they would die. When it was all over with, he said, you passed the test. It was only water in the capsule. 
And he set them up for that by having what he called white knights. I think that's what he called it. And they had done it so many times that each time they thought it was pause. And he said, this is the real thing this time. And he said, you've passed the test. You trust me. If 900 and something people could trust a man that much, couldn't you trust Jesus Christ? And everybody who drove here tonight drove by faith. As a matter of fact, I drove up to the rascal house this morning and had breakfast, and I drove by faith. <laughs> and when Ray Hart drives, it takes more faith. <laughs> when you drive down the highway, you're trusting everybody on that side of the road to stay over there. <laughs> and sometimes you're trusting drunks and dope addicts. And you're trusting him with your life. And I ask you to trust Jesus Christ with your eternal life. And you say, well, I can't. No, it's not that you can't. It's that you won't. I'm going to tell you something. I'll close. The only thing that stands between a man and his salvation is his will. John 5, 40, Jesus said, you will not come to me that you might have life. Didn't say you could not come, said you would not come. You would not come. In a moment, I want to ask you, if you haven't trusted Christ to do it, I want you to put it in his hand. Many have done it this week. I trusted him when I was 11 years old as a little boy. F.G. Pentecost said two and two is four. That's mathematics. He said hydrogen and oxygen form water. That's chemistry. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's revelation. And they said, well, how do we know? He said, the burden of proof lies with you. Put two and two together and see if you don't have four. Put hydrogen and oxygen together and see if it doesn't form water. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and see if you won't be saved. I heard a fable of an old bull down in Texas. It's a fable, of course. But it illustrates the truth. Before the days of automatic waters, a man built an automatic water for his cows. He built a huge tank. And at the top of the tank, he had a float. And going up to the float, he had a ramp. And around the edge of the tank, he had a trough. And he'd fill the tank with water. And when the cows would walk up the ramp and stand on the float, their weight would force the water up into the troughs. Then they drank all the water they wanted. They'd come back down the ramp licking their lips. <sniffs> There's a great old bull, big bull there. He looked at them. He said, there ain't no water in that trough. They're just putting on. And when all the cows got away from the water, water of the bull walked over near the water and his neck was long. He stuck his old neck up and stretched it and, and looked over in the trough. And sure enough, there wasn't any water in it. He said, I knew there wasn't anything in it. They're just pulling my leg. He was a Georgia bull. <laughs> the cows got thirsty. They walked up the ramp and stood on that platform, and the water would come up into the troughs, and they drank all they wanted. Walked back down, licking their lips. He said, ain't no water in that trough. Stretched his own neck and looked up, and sure enough, it was dry. But if he had ever walked up on that that ramp and up on that platform he had have found there's enough water in the trough to drink as long as he wanted and a man who stands back and keeps looking over and says I don't know about them Christians they get in there and laugh like they're having a good time and they they're all carrying them Bibles around their hand act like they enjoy reading it but <laughs> and they walk up and down the street singing and carrying on like they're happy but They're strange people. I think they're just licking their lips. I don't think there's any water in that trough. But you old bull, you. If you'll walk up the ramp and stand on the platform and put your weight on Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm trusting you and just standing on you and depending on you to get me to heaven, you will find out there is water in the trough. And you will find out it's springing up into everlasting life, John chapter 4. 
I don't care what your religious background is. If you go to heaven, you're going to have to trust Jesus Christ. There's no other way to go. I want us to stand together quietly and reverently. Thank you for listening. You're too easy to preach to. I preach too long. Boy, there's nothing like the Bible. Every verse I quote seems it gets better. The story gets sweeter and sweeter. Dooder and dooder. It's turning to tugger. Boy, it's something. And God wants everybody here to go to heaven. I want everybody to go to hell. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And perhaps the organist will come in a moment. I'll ask you to play something softly. If we have an organist, do we have an organist here? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and nobody's looking. I wonder how many will say to me, Dr. Hudson, I know. And listen, I'm not going to come back to you and embarrass you. You've already been a sweet crowd and let me speak into you tonight. I'm not going to embarrass you. I may never see you again. Probably won't see many of you again. But I wonder with our heads bowed and eyes goes, how many will say to me, Sir, I do know that if I were to die, I would go to heaven. Now, if you know that, raise your hand and keep it up just a moment. But if you don't know it, don't raise your hand. If you have doubt about it, don't raise your hand. You may be a church member, you may have religion, but if you have doubts about whether or not you're going to heaven, don't raise your hand. And you may put them down. That's fine. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you. I wouldn't hurt you for a million worlds. I'm here to help you. But some of you could not raise your hand that you know you're going to heaven. How many of you would say, Dr. Hudson, that made sense to me. And I think I can relate to that sermon. And I believe I do understand what you said. First, I do understand that I'm a sinner. I, most people say to me, good night, I know I'm a sinner, man, no doubt about that. I mean, say, yes, I, I could understand I'm a sinner, and, and I do understand what you said, that Jesus did die for us, and I've read the story, and I've heard it, and I've read John 3, 16. And I do believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross, and I do believe he died for the world, and I know I'm part of the world, and I know he died there for me. And when he died on the cross, he paid what I owe. And I can understand what you mean when you said... You accept it by faith. You, you can't see him, but you believe that he did it. And you say to him, though you can't see him, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to put it in your hands and trust you to get me to heaven. How many would say to me with heads bowed and eyes closed, I will trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. I understand I'm a sinner. I understand Jesus died for me. And from the night on, if I die... After I leave this building, from this moment on, I'm depending on him. Like you said, faith was not looking at him, but looking unto him. I'm looking unto him to get me to heaven. I'm depending on him to get me to heaven. And not only looking unto him, I'm looking away from everything else. I'm not going to depend on what money I've given. I'm not going to depend on how good I've lived. I'm not going to depend on my church membership or my good works. But I'm going to look only unto Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, how many will raise your hand and say, That's me. I will trust Christ as my Savior. Beginning tonight, I'm depending on him. Raise your hand real high and let me see it. You can put it up and put it back down. I won't embarrass you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Is there anybody else who will do it? I know the Lord would not have had me to preach that sermon to seven or eight people. I know there are many others that ought to say, yes, I will trust him. I promise you we're not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come back to you. As a matter of fact, when you raise your hands, I'm going to close in prayer and that'll be it. Is there somebody else say, yes, I'll trust him. Before you close the service, I want to raise my hand and indicate that I'm trusting him to get me to heaven. Would you slip your hand up? Just put it up high and put it right back down. God bless you. Are there others? I'll wait just a moment because I feel there are many others that ought to do it. Are there others? I want to pray in a moment. Would you raise your hand and say, I'm going to trust him to get me to heaven. I raise my hand as an indication of it. Would you raise your hand right now and let me see it? Anybody else? Anybody else anywhere? Anybody else anywhere? All you that raised your hands here, there, and the other place, and way in the back, would you all raise them again together and let me see all of you at one time? Several went up and went back down. How many raised them? Raise them again. Would you do it? Let me see where you were. Yes, 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 yes. A good number of you. Now you that raised your hand, when you pray, you don't talk God into doing something. When you pray, you're actually expressing the fact that you're trusting Him and what He's already done. What He's going to do, He's already done. But I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. 
And maybe you didn't raise your hand that you would trust him, but maybe you'd like to pray this prayer with me and tell him in your own words you will trust him. You do not pray out loud. I won't ask you to pray out loud. You can pray silently. Pray this little prayer with me if you mean it from your heart, especially everyone that raised your hands that I'll trust him. Would you pray this little prayer with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner and I do believe that you died for me. And tonight, the best I know how, I do trust you as my Savior. Jesus, from this minute on, I'm depending on you to get me to heaven. Now help me to live for you and to be a good Christian. Now let me finish the prayer. Dear Jesus, bless all those who prayed. Jesus, I, I pray that many prayed. And I pray that those who did pray will make that public and come tell the pastor and say, hey, I've trusted Jesus and now I want to get into the church and serve the Lord. I pray they see the pastor say, I want to get into the church now. I've trusted Christ. Speak to their hearts about that. And may they have assurance in their hearts. May they know that something wonderful has happened. They've been born again. Heads about eyes of clothes. How many say to me, I prayed that prayer with you, sir. Slip your hand and put it back down. How many say, I, I joined you in that prayer? Many of you, many of you, many of you. Yes, yes, yes. Father, thank you for the service tonight and for the good people, for the sweet fellowship we had around the table together, for the wonderful meal. Help us not to take your blessings for granted. Help us to know that the loveless flower that grows in the garden of man's heart is gratitude. And when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, is well nigh gone. Dear Jesus, help us to be grateful for every blessing, for every expression of love, for every warm handshake, for every friend. Make us grateful people. And we are grateful for these moments together, these few hours together, three now to be exact, since seven, nearly ten now. We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray you have been blessed by the message you've just heard. The Sword of the Lord has many helpful materials available for purchase. For a free catalog, please call 1-800-251-4100. Or you may reach us on the web at swordofthelord.com. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you.